Hello, welcome to the last tackle podcast on loverugbyleague.com, the ultimate home rugby league on the web. I'm James Golden, joined by Drew Dabshire, and we've got rugby league journalist and top dog Gary Carter from The Sun uh, in the studio. Gary, thanks for uh, taking the time to be with us. Not a problem, I'm not sure I'm a top dog, but... <laughs> That's what I was told, your agent told me to say that in the uh, in the brief, so... Um, yeah, we... she's getting a quid on <laughs> we, uh, We'll just we'll chat about last week's games, we'll chat, uh, chat about this week's games and talk about the World Cup Challenge as well, and we'll talk a bit about you, Gary, as well, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so just a quick run through of last week's games, starting Wigan, Wigan Toronto. Um, we were just having a little bit of a chat. Toronto, people seem, there seems to be a bit of hysteria building around Toronto not doing well, but you wouldn't have expected them to win any of the three games that they've played so far anyway on paper, would you say? No, you wouldn't. I mean, there was a lot of hysteria about Toronto not doing well because there was a lot of hysteria about Toronto before a ball was kicked. Obviously, with the signing of Sonny Bill Williams, that creates its own hysteria. But then... We get to a stage where results count and obviously like Toronto have lost three. But just on, if you look on paper, you wouldn't have expected Toronto to win. But I think from the three games they've lost, Toronto, Toronto can take a lot more because personally, I think the score will flatter Wigan by the end of it. Yeah, they've been competitive in all three <laughs> games, haven't they? I mean, well, I mean, Casford obviously did, but they started well against Casford. They obviously competed against Salford. And like I say, in that second half when it was 10 all against Wigan, you, you still felt like, oh, actually, they might. There was potential. It wasn't all certain think, that Wigan yeah, were going to win. Yeah, I think it, it was till about the hour mark. It was that. Uh, it was the Burgess try, wasn't it? That, yeah, that yeah, it was. Yeah. And then obviously, to, I think Liam Farrell got two in the last five minutes, which uh, sent Wigan home. But uh, I thought Toronto made a, a good account of themselves. Uh, I thought Adam Sidlow stood up pretty well. Uh, I think he he was probably one of the best forwards on the field, that including Wigan's pack as well. Uh, I was impressed with the, with the Wolfpack, like like Gaz just mentioned. Going back to the first game at Castleford, the, I, I thought they were awful and I thought, well, they, they could certainly be relegated here, um, especially given Hawke Yard's form in the first two rounds as well. So um, I was fearful for the Wolfpack, uh, but they've turned it around. They're showing good signs. Um, let's not forget that some of these players for Toronto, they was playing in League One two years ago, the likes of Liam Kay and Andrew Dixon, yes, Andy Ackers as well. Um, so it's a big jump for, for for some of these boys. What Gary, what do you make about the the Toronto thing about obviously this thing? I know Gaz Walker did something this week about um, Brian Noble saying that they're in ten, they need to pay ten fifteen percent more on wages to persuade players to go there. Obviously, they've been banging on about the dispensation and things like that. What, what do you think about? Personally, I mean, as Brian Noble himself admitted, they raised the point about dispensation too late. They should have raised it. From the moment they were promoted, from the moment they won the million pound game, they should have raised it then. In terms of the argument as to whether they have to pay more or not, I can see both sides of it really. I mean, obviously, like there's a lot, lot more sort of costs involving ferrying players and staff to and from Toronto, but also, if you just do a quick look at the tax situation, they pay a similar amount in Canada as you do over here. The only place where the tax situation comes into play is with Catalan because they pay far less income tax than we do here. Mm. So they, you can actually sort of pay players less on the contract, but he has to come out with more in the pocket. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So the take homes. Mate. So yeah, but I can see, uh, I can see both arguments with the transfer thing. But the main point for me is this should have been done months ago. Mm. I think, I mean, th- there's a little bit of a position where obviously they've had to, oh, I was having, I mean, I always get in scrapes on Twitter and stuff, but there was having a discussion about they had to pay a bit more when they were in League One to persuade players to play in League One. Yes, but, course, yeah. but now they're in Super League, is there a great deal of difference of having to choose between Toronto and Salford, for instance? You well, know, like. But this is what I mentioned on last week's show, James, that it starts from, from when, you, when they, they were first formed in 2017, when they were going into that League One season. They shouldn't have spent all that money. Because no disrespect to other League One teams, they could have bought 10, 10 of those players instead of 20 odd of those players uh, on professional deals. Then maybe have signed 10 Canadian uh, players and still get promotion from League One. So they got re- the recruitment and retention wrong from the start, uh, paying players far too much, maybe double or triple the salaries that, that they were on at Championship and Super League clubs uh, to go over to Toronto. And uh, obviously it's important to, to realise and remember that Darcy Lussie, the the prop that they signed from Manly, um, 
was a marquee player at the time, but now they've signed Sonny Bill. So Sonny Bill, uh, Sonny Bill Williams and Ricky Latelli, they're the marquee players at the Wolfpack. So that means Darcy Lussick's marquee wage that he's on, he's still on that wage, but his full wage now counts on the salary cap. So everyone's going on about, oh, Sonny Bill is on earning five million over two years and all this. It's it's probably Lussick that is damaging the cap. And I'm not, I don't mean to just single out one player. I think that's a little bit unfair, but it's important to, to remember that there's players who are on Toronto's salary cap on more money than what the Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is those that those three players you just mentioned, Sonny Bill, Latelli and, and Lussick, uh, and uh, pro- that, that's like 600 grand of their cap yeah, just on them three players, pretty much. Lussick's pretty probably much, on yeah. more than 200, uh, it's fair to say. You've also got likes like Joe Meller as well. I mean, personally, I think the mistakes were made last season in the, in the chasing of Super League rather than now they've reached Super League because you've got players... There now, who were on the contract they were on last year, who were on overinflated salaries for the level they should have been at, whereas and now Toronto are sort of finding, oh no, we can't, we can't bring players in because we're full up on the cap, so mm. they're having to pay for, they're having to pay the price in a way for chasing Super League rather than reaching Super League. I I made this point in the editor's column this week. Would it have been better, or do we learn from this that they should have just started in Super League? Because ultimately, the problem they've got... We're sort of saying that the hangover that's causing this problem primarily is because they've had to work up through League One and Championship. Whereas if they'd have just started in Super League and they were recruiting a Super League team from day dot, maybe they wouldn't have over, over-egged it. The, the reason... I, I personally would have had them start in League One because they were an entirely new club and an entirely new entity. Whereas, say Ottawa, for instance, they're taking on an existing franchise, so... They they're sort of slightly a slightly different case whereas Toronto were a brand new entity and so I think they should have started at the bottom with the way up. Same in foot, same in football. Yeah, if, yeah. if a brand new team comes into football, you have to start at division eight or nine. Yeah, I think yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. You have to work your way up, and again, it sort of adds a bit more to Toronto's argument whereby. Like they can turn around and say we worked our way up rather than we were just parachuting yeah. in. Because that, that, well, then what? Because obviously Catalan they put straight in to the to Super League, and obviously I mean. Well, the a, logistics are obviously much easier for yeah, for Catalans than than what it is for Toronto. I think without, without trying to disrespect League One again, that if Toronto failed in that first year, uh, they would have just been out of League One, and not not many people would have been too bothered about it. But if they if they were started in Super League and they failed yes. in that first year and went bust, then everyone would be talking about it, and everyone it'd be, it'd be another PSG story, wouldn't it? What do you think could happen if? The, I mean, we. I mean, we were just talking. We don't think they're going to get relegated. But what do you think is going to happen if they get if they were to get relegated? If they were to get relegated, Sonny Bill moves to to Lee. He's getting promotion <laughs> from the championship. He could move to Rochdale. He lives there. Actually, no, he lives in Salford. Sorry, he lives in Salford. Trains in Rochdale. So he could move to either an empty on this. But I personally think if Tor- say Toronto are relegated, a it won't be a shock to them because Brian McDermott has already broached the subject with the people that run the club. But b it's a massive test of David Ar- Argyle's commitment yeah. to whether he wants to keep on with Toronto because, let's face it, without Argyle, there'd be no Toronto. Yeah. So if, if, if David Argyle decides, that's it, I've had enough, now we're out of Super League, then I think Toronto will go. Whereas it, if David decides, I want to keep it going and build again and perhaps alter a few things, there's a real test of his commitment then from then mm-hmm. on in. Um, we, talk, we move on, we talked a little bit about Old KR being the team... Bit of a surprise that they lost fifty two ten at, at Leeds in terms of not necessarily that they lost, but in the manner that they lost because they'd done well the previous two weeks. I gotta say it was a, the scoreline was was a surprise considering how well they played at Hull the week before. Mm. But again, they can sort of point to the hangover from a derby with it being a massively emotional occasion and things like that. Whereas and then it's like after the Lord Mayor's show, so they can perhaps sort of argue that that's why the scoreline was blown out in the way it was. And Leeds had obviously had the week off. Cause yeah, but I think there are positives to, to take from the Leeds' point of view. I think it was the first time in over three years that they've beat a team by 50 points. Uh, so that's a, a big plus for the Rhinos. Uh, and even more importantly, that than Luke Gale, uh, he had a cracking game, um, which he didn't do in the first uh, in the first round. I, I don't think he, he controlled the game much better and he had much more of a control. Do we think Leeds will be competing for top five? I in my pre season tipping thing, which is no gauge of where teams are gonna finish, I put Leeds sixth. Because right. having spoken to Richard Agar, he doesn't necessarily want them to go from 
battling relegation to the top of the table. Mm. He wants to sort of go. Yeah, little, to show steps. progress. So mid, I think fifth or sixth, they'd be happy with this year. I mean, fifth, they'd be really happy mm. with. Sixth, they won't be downhearted. As either. long as they'd taken it to the end to yeah. to compete for playoffs. Um, I presume you were at Salford as well on Friday night, were you? Um, Huddersfield game. Yes, I was. Yeah. Um, headbutt gate. We're calling it headbutt gate. <laughs> Twelve. Obviously, Huddersfield good win for us. Field Twelve Ten. To be fair, but what did you make of that? Uh, I mean, there was a. Lot, it was a, a game whereby two sides pretty much cancelled each other out. Having looked at it again, Aidan Caesar was the difference because everything mm. he did was. The heart of Huddersfield good work, even to the point where he produced a cover tackle that denied Ken Seal first time in the corner. So he's showing that he's stepping up to the mark and fulfilling the billing, which is which, which to be fair, Huddersfield haven't had in for a few mm. years. Yeah, they've spent big, but the players they've spent big on haven't lived up to the billing, whereas Aiden and Caesar already is. And they've got a decent selection of like young players, haven't they, to fit around? Yeah, they've got well, they've obviously got the senior boys who can stick out wide. I'm a big fan of Daniel McIntosh. He can play anywhere across. Uh, the bat line but I'm impressed with uh, Lee Gaskell in the arms I think Aidan Caesar <laughs> compliments uh, Gaskell really well Gaskell's known for his running game and he can do a lot more of that this year because it's Caesar who's doing all the organising around him and Gaskell can can do the off the cuff uh, stuff um, we'll have to have our weekly Israel full hour segment now <laughs> um, so Catalan beat Casford 36-18 and of course he had to score and, uh, on his debut and, and, and what not there's still, I know Robert Elston said at Man of Steel on Monday, you know, that they're still looking at, they're still looking at legals and stuff like that around it. Is it just time that they just sort of put it to bed and just let them, let them get on with playing? Well, for me, if there was legals, they would have investigated it by now anyway. Mm. The fact he's signed and registered is because there's no legal block to stop yeah. him. Which is the, why Rugby Australia had to settle out of court with him well, the, anyway. Well, that's, that's where the loophole comes because Rugby Australia settled out of court he didn't go all the way to a legal stage whereby then there'd be a definitive decision as to whether yes he mm. yes he can or no he can't. But also the reason why why he is in Super League now is because he was a rugby union player at the time, he therefore cannot have the bringing the game into disrepute thing thrown at him because no. he wasn't part of the game. Um for me, it's getting it's time to move on now. Well like it or not, Israel Falau's here, let him play in as a purely as a player he could be a hell of a player. Is he? So he he's, he won't be counting on the salary cap, will he? Because obviously it's it's he's not played in the last five years. Well, technically not. No, so under the returning talent. Thing. Yeah, yeah. So he's for the first year. Um, and he's only signed a one year deal as well. He has, yes. Yeah, I'd imagine it. Until, do you, do until you think, he goes back to rugby union in a year's time after turning up Super League for Castle. <laughs> do you do you think that do you think that they'll be making a move to try and stop a future contract being registered? Well, I actually mentioned that to Gemma before me. Super League made this thing about wanting greater authority and bringing greater authority in, which essentially is just a, a new gentleman's agreement. But uh, obviously he signed a one-year deal, which is registered and gone through and everything. What happens if, say, Catalan wants to keep him on for mm. next year or the year after? Do Super League then bring their greater authority in or can they, do they just turn around and say, well, he'd already had a contract anyway, so we have to let that re- be registered? Yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting debate because you always feel like clubs are quite happy to take the moral high ground until there's a player that's affecting them or a player that they want to sign. Um, on that subject, we won't go into it too much, but Warrington, of course, had were without Anthony Gellin at the weekend and lost 18-8 at Wakefield. What did you make of him changing the team? Obviously, he had an enforced change. You know, he had to replace Gellin, but what about dragging Matty Ashton out as well? I was... Surprised that Matty Ashton didn't feature at all, really. I thought Matty Ashton would either be on the bench or at centre where Gillian would have been. Because, I mean, you sign Gareth Wood, you've got to play him if he's fit, really, haven't you? Because otherwise, what's the point in mm. signing him? So, the thing with Whip and Steph Ratchet is they can swap around as either one or six. So, I can, I can understand why Stefan was at one and Gareth Wood at six. I'm not so sure whether Matty Ashton... Maybe could have gone in the centres or not. I mean, as a res- as a result turned out, people be throwing out Steve Price all the time. But yeah, I suppose if they'd have won, we wouldn't probably have mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. But, I, but I think you can't really take Matty Ashton out of the team with the way. Based on them, thought, well, that's with, the thing. With, I mean, you beat Saint Helens nineteen 0 and you think, well, why would you change that and team? I, I actually thought he would have played on the wing uh, against Wakefield, maybe instead of Tom Lynham, because I thought you you simply couldn't drop. 
Ashton with the way he's played in the first two games, and we've seen how quick he is as well. Mm. Um, I'd probably put him up there with Regan Grace in an 100 metre sprint. Um, so I thought he would have played. But you, as Gaz said, you've, you've got to play with him. If you're paying him the money you are, and, you, and he's on a marquee deal, he's but would got you, to play, hasn't he? I, I was talking to, to Matt Turner actually last night, and I was saying, would you not have, like... I know, obviously, the coach isn't bothered about this thing necessarily, but would you not have wanted to hold with it back and have his debut at Warrington on a decent pitch Friday night against Toronto and, and make a big deal of it? I actually think it might have been better, you know, easing him in sort of away from home, sort of get, get him playing rather than chuck make a big in deal of him and chuck mm. extra pressure on him. Because he is an England international, he is an NRL grand final winner. So maybe it would have been better sort of easing him gently, for want of a better phrase, than sort of chucking him straight in against War- yeah. Warrington where the focus would have been on him. Yeah. I mean, I don't know Gareth that well. I'm not entirely sure what it'd be like for the pressure and spotlight and things like that. Because even though he's played NRL, he's played at NRL teams where there are other stars that yeah, almost he's take, not being take the, responsibility off him. He's almost been like, Another fourth, player rather yeah. than the player. But obviously the reserves are, are in place for, for this year. I don't know what Warrington's reserves fixtures are like because every other fixture seems to be cancelled at the minute because of the weather. Uh, but could he not have played a reserve game for, for Warrington? Maybe sold out... Could have had Joe, Re- could have Joe Redstone to witness. <laughs> well, That's a great well, idea. Well, could, well, to, <laughs> to be fair, we'll though, if, if Warrington bunked it up a bit, they could have got maybe 1,000, 2,000 people through the, the gates of Victoria Park That's and, and ease him in that way because obviously could, Leilani he, last two has been... Being on Joe Reg and been playing reserves at Warrington. Yes, he could have. Uh, yeah, I think Joe Reg and up to witness is a great idea. <laughs> um, the other game last week was Saints won at Hull. Um, Hull, and I'd, I'd come off the back of two decent wins, and obviously then, but then I don't think. I mean, people are talking, oh, typical Hull, you know. But I suppose losing at home to the champions isn't the end of the world. Yeah, from the from the sound. I mean, I wasn't there, but from the sound of it, it was ten minutes that changed the game really. Um, Hull will probably take. A lot out of it, the fact they competed with St. Helens, who were a million miles ahead of the rest last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. So, who can take positives in that, that they competed? Uh, but, obviously, Saints can take positives in the result as well. And going into the World Club this week, they needed the win, so... It was a Johnny Lomax masterclass as well, by, by all the points at Hull. So, obviously, well, that leads us into the World Club Challenge. So, this week, Saints, Sydney Roosters... Um, we can talk about all sorts here, but do you think Saints have got a... Can Saints compete with the Roosters? Yes, definitely. Yeah, Saints can definitely compete with the Roosters because they've shown both at club level and more crucially where this will come in at international level that they have players that can do it at international level. Whereas, obviously, like playing Super League week in, week out becomes a bit of a grind, doesn't it? Whereas this is sort of a bit mm. out of the grind. Whereas St. Helens plays like so Walmsley and Thompson and Johnny Lomax have shown for England that they can do the business for England as well. So that experience will come in handy for them. And do you think Christian Wolf? it's a bit like the whole Tonga situation where as much as Saints are the champions, they will be the underdogs in this game and maybe Christian Wolf can can learn on some of the Tonga stuff that he's done against Australia, New Zealand and England or Great Britain. Too. And also he's coached teams, albeit in Sasha level, to perform up on the day. Mm. Whereas this, this, this isn't like a normal run-of-the-mill game, this is a one-off occasion. He's got experience of building teams up to perform on the one off occasion and I think that will come in useful. Um what what do you think about the obviously it always generates the format <laughs> and the timing and you know when to do it. Is it is it almost impossible to resolve the, the you know, when would you have it? I know a few people say have it after the grand final, but my position on that is well you can't really have it after the grand final because that's the pinnacle, isn't it? And, the, and, that, and that's when you want all the internationals as well. So yeah. people people need to prioritise <coughs> because we're obviously going back to, to last autumn we, we had the build up to the GB tour um, and that took precedent because it was straight after the grand final and, then you, and not to forget the, the World Cup nines as well mm. um, so you've got to prioritise we, we already play enough games as it is in a season over here and then you want the World Cup challenge another high intensity game <laughs> straight after the, the grand final I think it's I don't think it's the right thing to do, but then again, where does it where does it fit in? Because at the end of the day, for the Roosters, it's a pre-season game, isn't it? It's a, it's the I, first game they'll play. Personally, I will cut the loop fixtures. Then again, I cut loop fixtures anyway. Yeah. Cut them after the World Club challenges, like the final pre-season final trial game the week before the seasons actually start. That's why. I so align it. align the Super League season with the NRL season then. But whether it's aligned or not, I. Certainly cut the loop fixing, I think the week before the start of the Super League mm. season anyway. 
Whether the NRL then kicks off a couple of weeks later on from that, I'm not sure. And have it as a big, like, this is the rugby league season start. Exactly, yeah. Curtain yeah. Yeah, exactly. Would, you that, keep, that, would you keep Magic Weekend, guys? Yes. Yeah, I would, purely because... Well, I'd keep it in Newcastle purely because every time it's been in Newcastle, it's made money. And let's face it, Super League and Rugby League needs money. So you can't get rid of a thing that makes money for the sake of it, really, can and, you? And the other thing is, is Newcastle, actually, Rugby League in the North East is, mm. is blossoming a it's little bit off yeah, the back yeah. of it. So it, and, that, and really, that was the purpose of Magic Weekend when it first got created. It was about expanding the game. And, you know, we get a lot of contributions. We had something last week. Um, Jeff Ball, we speak to all the time. He was up there in, <laughs> in the North East. And there's loads of positive stuff going on there. Yeah, and, is, yeah. You know, it's perhaps a shame, you know, that that Newcastle didn't get promoted last season into Championship because that would have added another dynamic mm. to it. Them being, you know, it would have been an, a miracle, I suppose, for them to get promoted in the first season. But at <laughs> least they'd have only been a season away from Super League potentially. And we've just seen four, four Newcastle Academy lads have just been selected for England Academy as well. So it it does show that potential is there for for the North East to grow. In there was league. there was a bit of chatter about. Is the scope to expand? The, I know we did the World Cup series a little bit a few years ago. There was a little bit of chatter about that. Um, you know, is there a way of expanding it a little bit? One of my, I, I thought, well, could you have the Challenge Cup winners say play the NRL, whoever finished first, and then obviously have that as a game, and then have the 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 genuine World Cup challenge. And then my, if you're getting the two Aussie teams over here, could you not have them playing an actual NRL game over here as like a, you know at Wembley or somewhere as a way of. Because presumably NRL wants to grow their footprint as well. Personally, I think the playing of the NRL game over here is too much. I go, again, harping back to my idea, get rid of the elite fishes, have the World Club challenge the weekend before the start of the Super League season. But also, have the, if you're going to have a second game, have the second game. But the second game should be League Leaders Shield winners yeah. against the minor premiers in yeah. the NRL. Unless... Obviously, if they're both if they're, they're both, both the same, same some sort of if they're both the same, have leaders shield as least leaders shield winners against the second place team mm. or the grand final losers in the NRL. I, j- I just don't think that the, like the World Club series works. I think it's sh- it's got to be just the World Club challenge between the two the two biggest and best teams. Um, or, or at least, or at least the World Cup series was a bit like there wasn't necessarily a, it wasn't fixed who was playing who was it. It was just whoever could be bothered coming over. Yeah, it was essentially the three teams that could be bothered coming over. I mean. I I go two games and have it written into a contract whereby cause if you have the League Leader Shield winners involved as well, therefore it adds a bit more to yeah, the League Leader Shield. You could call it so you could have the World Club Challenge and the, the World Club Shield or something like that and have it as two well, separate want, yeah. events or something like that and do it that way. Um do do you think um do you think it's the do you think the NRL will ever buy into it and No. No, absolutely no do, chance. Not while do, they've got the TV deal, they've got no. And do you think it will always be over here? I mean, I know obviously we've had a couple in Australia, but it I depends. think 19 out of the last 21 have been over here. A lot depends on the... Well, again, at the minute, it depends on the club that wins it. I mean, Melbourne, if Melbourne had won it last year, they were up for coming over this year. Mm. Whereas when Leeds had to go over to there, they obviously weren't happy to come over. But it's a, about logistics, but should should it be rested on? the simple fact of whoever wins it makes the decision mm. for me there should be an agreement in place between the RFL and the NR and the NRL saying the World Club Challenge is played then there whether it be here in Australia or a neutral venue mm. there should be something written in place to say look it's going to be then and there yep um, please do keep an eye out on the site um, all through the week and over the weekend we'll be there on, on Saturday to cover that game um, guys, we'll talk a little bit about you now, if that's all right. Um, <laughs> so, just, just obviously, no you've been there, around right? the scene. You've been around the scene for a long while. I mean, I always say, I think one of the things I always say when I finish uni and I start doing games and stuff, you learn a lot more from being in press conferences. Oh, you know, yeah. watching like yourself, you know, the likes of yourself and, and how you approach things and, and stuff like that, or how not to approach things. <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but you said it. Um, how did you get? How did you get started in in the first place? Well, I've been a been a journalist for more than twenty years now. I'm going to sound really old here now. <laughs> been a journalist for more than twenty years. Actually, started as a news journalist at the local paper to where I live. Then I became a news journalist at the Lancashire Union Telegraph in Blackburn. Then again, again at a national paper. But I've always wanted to get get into sport. I've always had an interest in sports reporting. So. When I was at the National Newspaper, I did bits and bats for 
sport, sport wise, but did did stuff with the sports desk and did the odd sports report and everything. And then going to rugby league, doing just doing matches basically. Like the second, say the two games I do the second game on mm-hmm. on the Friday night or what have you. Then, just over ten years ago, I basically got a phone call saying, "Do you fancy doing it full time?" So I went, "Yeah," <laughs> and then that was it. Really, yeah. that was my job interview. Oh well, that sounds like a good. One. I mean, people don't necessarily realise, you know, it's all it, as much as you talk about Wembley and, and Old Trafford, and the, it's all about. But the, people don't necessarily see the the treks to Hull KR on a Friday night <laughs> or whatever to cover the games. No, true. That way, but you still still love that side of things as well. Well, yeah, it, it, I always say it beats working for a living. <laughs> but uh, no, I, like obviously, there's a lot of travelling. If you just say to someone, look. Do you want to work Friday night, Saturday, Sunday? They'll go, no, I'll just take 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, thank you, in an office. Whereas here it's always different. That's that's the beauty of it. It's always different mm. for good and bad reasons. Well, it can be good, can be bad reasons, as Israel Falao will know. <laughs> uh, it's different every day. Yeah, It's just different. It, there's no, you don't get bored of it. Well, I don't anyway, but... Uh, obviously, it means that all your weekends during the season are... Uh... Are taken up pretty much. So well, I, all I, the weekends are taken up anyway because I do football as well. Oh, so you're so all year round. So, when, so when do you take Mrs Carter on holiday? Normally January. Oh right. Normally so. January. So it's a, a winter break. Yes. Well, we we we're, we're quite lucky in a way in that fact that my brother-in-law Gemma's brother lives in Australia, so we can go down there for their summer, and then oh we can go so go somewhere, what that's warm in January. So we we tend to take a week or a week and a half in January. And, that's holiday, basically. So you do all right. You do all Try right. Try to. <laughs> how, how do you... One of the things that I... I mean, obviously, I've done it for 10 or so, 10 or 15 years. It's like one of the things that I always try and keep, and this might be why you do the football, is you try and keep your toes in other places because rugby league can be so draining sometimes. Not in a not in a deg negative way, but just because just because of the way rugby league is and the whole everyone wants it to be better and everyone's frustrated about. Is that something you notice? Yeah, everything, I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of frustration in a game that everyone wants it to be better and obviously there are days when you want your article going as the main article on the page when it appears just like in a column or in, in a little box but there also has to be a realism really in that rugby league isn't that big a sport to demand page leading a national newspaper every day, for me anyway. Uh, the main thing, that, again, th- 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 this is a bugbear in mind. The thing that cuts through more than anything is England, mm. with the deaths in London. Like you can say to people, "I've got a Wigan story, or I've got a Leeds story." They'll go, and this you're talking to a lad who's like, who's from Essex, who's been, who's had Premier League football fed down his throat for twenty five, thirty years, or what have you, and they can just say, "All oh, right." Whereas you say England, oh right. Mm. So they recognise they recognise it a lot more, which again sort of lends into me my thinking that internationals cut through better than anything and should should be placed at the top of the, of the game rather than club club thing. I mean, as good as the clubs are, the clubs are brilliant. Club games are brilliant. Internationals is is what you, is the way for getting better coverage for me. That's why Toronto grabs so many column inches, isn't it? Because Toronto, a rugby league team. In- in Toronto is I, mean, I remember doing up, I remember doing the, the original story that Toronto were coming into rugby league full stop and uh, I remember I remember explaining it through to the desk in the the, the, in the desk in London that the reply was you what <laughs> I'm like yeah honestly and they went no nah, it'll never happen I went honestly it's going to happen honestly <laughs> so they ran the story got a big reaction then I, 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 that actually got a big page lead because it was all three and a half thousand miles for an away game and mm. things like that like trekking across the Atlantic five, six hours, but can't remember whether it's five or six behind yeah. England. It's just so unusual. Um, but again, Toronto seized a lot of the pre-season media coverage this time around because people in London who don't know rugby league know about Sonny Bill yeah. Williams yeah. Through, through what he's done. And it, again, um, I know they, they, there has been a drive to make more personalities out of the players in the game, but... The, for me, the way to do that is to show what they're doing for England rather than what they're doing for the club levels because Wigan are huge in Wigan, Leeds are huge in Leeds, Hull and Hull are huge in Hull. England should be huge in them all and beyond. Mm. Do you uh, you know, do you think the international game, they need to change it? At the moment, it just feels like it's bolted on to the end of the season, whereas, you know, like, you know in football, there's regular international windows throughout. 
How do you mm. see them? Is there a way that they can do that, do you think? There is a way they can do that. For me, when you draw <coughs> the fish list up, you start off with, right, England are playing then, or maybe then and then, during the season, and we fit everything else around mm. it. Do you start off with the international game? That's the pinnacle, and everything else falls into place around that. It's one of the challenges that, realistically, the only competitive test for England requires someone travelling from the Southern Hemisphere. Or us travelling to the yeah. Southern Hemisphere. But <clears throat> that's going to happen this year, and had has been in <coughs> previous years, but... It's just just in the way it is. The way it is. I mean, rugby union's lucky up here in that they've got six nations, mm-hmm. seven nations, which can compete on a similar level. Whereas here, they, there's only one really. I mean, mid-season games against France have always been watched as because Catalans say, "Oh, he's injured, he's injured, he's injured, mm-hmm. he's injured." Whereas you play a game at the end of the season with France, they're much more of a better test. But you can't have one every other year. Mm-hmm. You've got to head to where the the teams are, and also with the they've, development of the Pacific nations obviously they are where they are where they are so I think there's got to be an element of common sense whereby look England want to get better the best teams are Australia New Zealand Tonga Samoa PNG as well so we've got to head to where they are I mean I don't think Australia playing a mid-season game other than playing New Zealand is pretty much off the rec- off the table because of state of origin yeah yeah, yeah. but you can play New Zealand or Samoa or mm. Tonga or. Do you think they give up? On... I also I also think it's important not to disrespect um, the home nations as well. Yeah, do you um, think they took France off the table too early? Because I know obviously, yeah, England were pumping France, but do you think a bit like it? You mentioned the Six Nations. Italy were getting pumped in the early years and then gradually have improved. Is the only way that France are going to improve is by? Playing and obviously now with the England team, you could in theory put an England team out without the Southern Hemisphere players, which might actually make it a bit more of a competitive game. But you've got to sell games as well. I mean, would you sell games whereby, yeah, it's England playing, but it's not with England without who are, who are essentially the best players yeah. that play down under. You've got to, if you're going to have an England game, you've got to have it so the best players available can play. But not you, not the best players are over here. Mm. But could you not have a, a double header, say mid mid season at, at Headingley, where it's England versus Jamaica and Wales v Ireland, mm. for example, um, because uh, you probably not want to sell Headingley out, but it's still a test for for England, and it also gets the home nations involved. And you, you like you was mentioning with um, right, being a country rather than clubs uh, for the national purpose. Wouldn't that be a perfect fitting, really? But again, you've got to have England's best players, and realistically, how many would England rack up against Jamaica with a full strength mm. team? Mm. Yeah, but but we've seen football, don't we? Eight nil and nine nil. Oh, yeah, you've you seen the football. But they're and... they're different. They're not friendly. They're qualification games, mm. so they have to be played. They are competitive games. It's just like look on the draw, as to who England play in football. The friendlies are often against Germany or well. That's why they brought the Nations League now in the football now because they yeah. wanted to remove that whole people not bothering with exactly. friendlies. They wanted some to play teams that are no, off exactly. a similar level. Exactly. Whereas rugby league's nowhere near in the position to be able to do that at the moment. Mm. I mean, I'd love to see England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland being really strong nations, but the simple answer is they're not. And mm. Wales, Scotland, and Ireland are a long way from becoming anywhere near strong enough to take on a full England team and to be fair you'd almost be a bit worried for England if you got to the point where, yeah. <laughs> where Wales and France and whatever could compete with England well no really. you wouldn't necessarily be worried because that would push England England Super League players on more mm. whereas now if you have an England team a full England team they'd be I mean for want of a better phrase it'd be a million miles ahead of Wales Ireland and France mm. wouldn't it mm. yeah. and Scotland um, it, we'll just touch on this a little bit Gaz if you don't mind after an England game years and years ago, you had before a before an England game. Was it before an England game? Sorry, you had a a life changing uh, incident. Um, I suppose so. <laughs> the yeah, the, the obviously yeah, life changing in a way. How, how did you? The rugby league community was really supportive it of was, you in that no, time, and I know, I know. I perhaps it was a perhaps a, a good reflection on your standard in the game and the respect <laughs> that you've got from people, not just from the community in general, but from high profile figures in the game offering support. So just just tell us a little bit about the whole that whole ex well, I wanna call it I don't I don't mean it as an experience no, if no, it was a fun I, thing, but yeah. Well, if I ever write a book, my first few chapters will be 
Woke up, couldn't talk, sorry. Woke up, couldn't move, my left side, sorry. Woke up, where am I, sorry. Not much of, not much to read there, but the reaction from... It was only sort of a few weeks later that the reaction from the rugby league community really sort of hit home for me in that, blimey, people know who I am for the right <laughs> reasons. But, I mean, basically my main mistake was going to the pub for my tea. <laughs> Can you remember and what it, you had for your tea? No. Oh. No, I'm, I'm, told, I'm told it's burger with sweet potato fries because... <laughs> I'm told I'm told off my wife if if say things didn't, didn't go how they had and turned out a lot worse my last message to her would have been a picture of a burger with sweet potato <laughs> <laughs> so um, at least I went sweet potato fries <laughs> but uh, no uh, the reaction from the rugby league community was great I mean the thing a couple of things hit on for me were when England wore the shirts before the New Zealand game, mm. they, uh, Sean O'Loughlin signed one and sent it to me. Didn't have to do it at all. Um, I was visiting hospital by Kevin Sefield and Sean Wayne and Chris O'Loughlin. Again, they didn't have to. So it just sort of showed, well, they must know who I am, really. I mean, I, I've always regarded myself as like another face in the, in the, in mm. the media crowd, you know, rather than standing out and things like that. And... Uh, like Leeds sort of released this treble book as well with Porsche going to me which was I, I mean I just can't again I can't thank them enough but initially I couldn't understand why they were doing it I'm like well why why are you doing that about me but uh, no it, it was a it was a strange experience Be, being honest, once I knew once I knew what was going on which took a few weeks after coming round Um uh, because initially I didn't know I'd been in a coma for six weeks. Mm, I yeah. just woke up thinking I'd been asleep overnight. Mm. Then was like, where am I? I was still in London, like, why am I here? Then um, got transferred to Salford Royal, which is when, obviously, I'd been on the doorstep of the community. A lot more people came to see me and things mm. like that. I once when I was in a little room on my own, they had a little window. And I remember going. I remember the window going very, very dark. I'm like, what the bloody hell's happened there? So I looked to me left, Navy and Molly stood at the window. I'm like, <laughs> what the hell? What's going on there? But yeah, Moss came to see me, and that was the second time, second or third time I've been walking because I've had like muscle wish, so I had to essentially learn to walk again. Mm-hmm. So I was like walking up and down, or trying to walk up and down the ward, and I've like Moss saying, apparently, it's like. Go on, guys. Go on, guys. Go on, guys. You can do that. I'm like, bloody hell, fire. That's Adrian Marley. <laughs> you know? But, uh, no, the, the, the reaction, the reaction from, from the game as a well, whole, even like fan people, even like people I wouldn't know from Adam, yeah, yeah. came up came up to me. The guy came up to me at Leeds. Karen not was my first game back on. I think it might have been my third or fourth game back. And he came up to me and just sort of said, I've been following your story and really, really glad to see you doing well and things like that. And I'm like, I'm like thinking, who are you? I've never met you before. You must obviously know who I am. Like, again, just just little things like that just sort of really sort of make an yeah. impact. Like the fellas who, who I wouldn't know, wouldn't recognise, um, just coming up and saying, look, great to see you back and things like that. They sort of hit on more, more than anything really, as much as anything. But the, so the stuff from... The people you would recognise again, sort of really, sort of really, sort of hit home again, sort of like, blimey, I must be doing something all right. Yeah, how difficult did you find it going back to work afterwards? Uh, actually, going back to work, doing the work. Yeah, like, did it, did you know? Was it was it just a case of well, I'm ready to go back to work? I'm I'm gonna get on with it. Again? Yeah, essentially, yeah, yeah. I remember like a. Uh, they had like a little whiteboard. I was still in hospital and they had like a little whiteboard and a felt tip pen. And I remember like writing like shorthand on the yeah. on the board and everyone was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> but you could I'm still like, read it back when you did it. Oh yeah, it's yeah. neater than my longhand writing. <laughs> <laughs> the shorthand is neater than my longhand writing. My longhand writing is like a spider running across a page. So obviously once you knew you could do that, you were fine. Oh yeah, well I always thought it was all right anyway. I always right. said to the consultant, I remember the consultant coming in to my room and he went he was sort of saying to me like didn't sort of explain to me how serious it all was he sort of gave hints as to how serious it all been he went and when do you want to go out when do you think you'll be discharged I'm like well the season starts on February the 4th 
so I need to be out by then. He sort of looks and went, yeah, right. <laughs> He's charged on February the 4th. <laughs> so what was your, do, you, do you remember what, what was your first game? Uh, back, first game we kept, went back to was, uh, it was at Leeds, wasn't it? Was it at Leeds? First game we watched was Alden v Warrington. Oh yeah, I went to Alden v Warrington in the cup because yeah. it was down the road. <laughs> <laughs> and then we did Salford. Sorry, I'm just like revising. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, just sort of going going back in, just getting back into games and things like it's just sort of like it sounds sounds like a proverb. This is like right there, but you yeah. just get back into get get back into it and just sort of. Do what you do, really. I suppose it helped. It was slightly the off season as well for you to have a bit of oh, a yeah, time. Timing, time. Timing's everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and obviously, it, obviously now Gemma is obviously in tow all the time or most of the time. I mean, well, how, I mean how, I'm annoying, Gemma, how, how annoying? How annoying is that? Or what with Gemma? <laughs> <laughs> she has I'm, she has the moments, but yeah. then again, I she probably I have my moments more moments than she has moments herself. But no, I mean, I could. Put it, put it as simple as possible, I wouldn't be doing what I do now if it wasn't for Gemma because, I, I mean, I can drive, but I can't drive any long distance. I mean, like, I had to do, I had to surrender my licence for a year. Then I did, did an assessment in St. Helens, driving for an hour around St. Helens, and uh, I did it, but I was told, I mean, I didn't know this at the time, I was told about the, uh, my face was about the same colour as that wall. Right. Uh, but, so I need to sort of build up my driving again. But I couldn't, I couldn't drive to any Super League ground at the minute. Mm. Well, not that I know of any. I need to give it a go. But I certainly couldn't drive to like Wembley or wherever mm. like that. Yeah. But uh, no, it's, it's just sort of building up. Yeah, but again, I wouldn't be anywhere near what I am now without Gemma. Yeah. Just, you still face any struggles now, you guys? Or? Getting downstairs, mostly. <laughs> Getting down steps without banisters. That's the biggest thing. Uh, I mean, my walking is affected because I remember going in to hospital a couple of months ago and uh, the nurse turned around and she went well why do you get why have you got an affected gait and I'm like well settle down and I'll tell you the full story <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no I mean just like the main thing where me I don't know if it's my balance or whether it's nerves or whatever is sort of going down stage you know, like going down steps yeah. to a stand in a stand yeah. without a banister I mean that's that's the biggest thing where I have more problems than ever was it Hull FC press box I bet that's a nightmare going up oh, there just a bit <laughs> Hull KR isn't because they've got banisters up the stairs but Hull FC is a nightmare that's a nightmare one. No, and obviously, yeah. G- obviously Gemma Gemma's building a little bit of an aura around herself <laughs> and I know she's sat here so I've got an to aura. what I say She's fantastic. We like the rugby league books, and she's always got a few tip offs of her uh, little thing. <laughs> the main thing that I've uncovered is a uh, is a uh, penchant for uh, rugby league men, obscure rugby league men. Honestly, yeah, I, I just sit there. And just... <laughs> this but is, this is your doing... chance to embarrass me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to. It do was that. it was it was one of them. I think I was. We did cast Toronto in pre season, and John Wilkins mm. said his wife had bought him like a, a Sonny Bill Williams phone, phone case. case yeah, yeah. Phone case. So I'm surprised you've not got one of them. Something similar on your phone. Well, it's not Gemma's birthday until September. <laughs> <laughs> so so we'll look at that. But yeah, so um, obviously great to uh, to obviously have got that behind you, and obviously back in in the game and uh, and whatever. What what is it that you most enjoy about what you do? Is it just that doing the matches week in week out, or is it? Well, what I enjoy most is the fact that no day is ever really the same. That's that's the main thing, really. I mean, I enjoy going to the matches and just seeing people and getting around. I was always taught. I was always asked earlier in my career, "What do I prefer, covering rugby league or football?" And my answer is always rugby league because. There's far more happens in a bad game of rugby league than a mm. bad game of football. I've seen enough bad games of both to know. <laughs> Especially off the field as well. Well, yeah. Um, in terms of like rugby league media in general, I, I mean, I feel like a lot, a lot of fans criticise the lack of coverage, but I do feel that in reality or in the respective size of rugby league, actually the coverage rugby league gets is actually quite fair. Yeah, in relation to the size of the game and the way it's focused, I personally can't argue with the coverage that rugby gets in national media because I think your average club games get the same amount of coverage as your club rugby union games. Mm. The only difference is the internationals and mm. European competitions. That makes it bigger. <coughs> Whereas, I mean, I get like thrown at me all the time, like, oh, it's only made a little box here, a little box here, a little box here, <coughs> whatever. Because 
there's no international link or no England link to wherever the story is. Mm. I mean, again, sort of link, going back to us, the Toronto thing, the Toronto thing still has an element of uh, really about yeah. it. So you always have, you always, I always have to explain like why Toronto mm. are in Super League and how they've got there and what they're doing and things like that, which sort of adds a, just naturally adds a more to the more to yeah. the story and more to the copy. I mean, there's there's also a big difference now in that a lot more newspapers are focusing a lot more on online mm. than the paper, which the paper is a physical thing. There's only a certain yeah. amount of space you've got on a page, whereas online you can sort of put yeah. as much as you, essentially as much as you want or as much as you feel, as much as you or anyone else can feel necessary on it. So I get that training for about 15 to 20 online stories a month. Right. And I, I, I sort of I send stuff to the paper every day, mm. and more often than not, they run it, they run something. So yeah. can't, again, can't complain. How, how obviously you you're more and more active on Twitter now, and I guess that's <laughs> partly because of Gemma because she loves it on there. Um, how how do you find that? Obviously, that's a lot different to when you would have started out. That interaction that you get with fans now yeah. on that on that platform it provides <clears> a lot more avenues for saying your opinion whereas when I did my journalism training and I'll clean this up the first thing I was told was that no one gives a toss about what you think yeah uh, whereas Twitter now has a lot more sort of scope whereby you can put opinions and mm-hmm. place opinions and like like anything like any debating chamber like parliament you say something it'll be 10 people agree with you 10 people disagree with you and what well, so Twitter now provides that forum where those people can voice their opinions. Mm. And people certainly let let you know their th- thoughts on you as well, don't they? On on me, as in what happened? Or... Yeah, you you've had a, oh, you've yeah, had no, a lot of you've had, you get you get a lot of stick. I get I get, ge- I get stick, but then people. I get I get stick, but then I get get stick in my front room, you know. <laughs> <laughs> get get stick off my mum, get stick off my sister, get stick off my father in law. <laughs> but but people should, I think. Think about it before they post because oh, yeah, I mean, I've like, seen some of the did, stuff that's been said to to guys on social media. Not just guys, like any any journalist who will mm. post uh, something in, in not not just in my league and anything, and a lot of people will reply back pretty quickly with some some harsh words, and they wouldn't say it to them in the street if they saw well, them in the street. Yeah, I mean they, that whether it's just online. me, I don't really post stuff on Twitter that I wouldn't say to someone mm. personally. You know, mm. yeah. I mean, like any sort of thought or comment piece about the game I put on I'd say to Robert Elston to Ralph mm. and to, to whoever even to Sean Wayne although you've got to be careful with Sean Wayne because I, I remember once when he's steaming up to me and going I'm really disappointed and you've done this you've done that done the other I'm like well you you answer questions in open press conference and he went he sort of so I went right okay then what's away I'm like blimey have I, have I angered him or whatever turns out when he actually sort of thought a little bit more of me that I thought I stood up for myself but again it's like if you're going to say something or write something you've got to believe yeah, it and back it up, back it up yeah. face to face yeah. for me anyway yeah I, 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 I must admit I've had a couple of run-ins with Sean Wayne so uh, you're not alone <laughs> in that one um, yeah. look ahead to uh, to this weekend's games then um, so there's five Super League games um, there's no Thursday night this week which everyone, hey. everyone moans about Thursday night games, but when there's not oh. a Thursday night game, everyone moans that there's no, not a Thursday night oh, game. It's strange that there's no Thursday night and a half term week. Yeah, it's a fair point. I mean, I mean, I just think, why wouldn't you have one anyway? I know because Saints are playing on... But you could have still had a Thursday and Friday show. Is it, is it three? Is so, it on Friday? Three yeah, so Casford... So Cass, Cass, on Thursday? Casford Wakefield is the Sky game. Um Home win for Cass there, you think? I personally would go home win for Casswood, but have you seen Wakefield on Sunday? They've got more than enough to put any team off the game. And that's been the case for a good few years, hasn't it, now with Wakefield? Is, you know, they, they, they've done really well to be as competitive as they are based on, on what they've got. Oh, yeah, they've done, done brilliantly. I've, Absolutely I've, superb for what they've got. Well, I have to Castleford's finished outside the top five, and so am I. Uh, unsurprisingly, they started the season very well. I've been impressed with them. So Powell was, we'll we'll was quite disappointed last week, wasn't he? Dabble Powell was quite disappointed with them last week, the the Catalan game. But I suppose that's yeah. one of the games that you wouldn't necessarily, if you were, if you were sat in front of your fixtures all at the start of the season, you wouldn't necessarily box off Catalan but, away as a win. Yeah, but, but, but you'd start off with just look at the, 
plain fixture you look off Catalan away Toronto away mm. will be the difficult games purely because of the logistics yeah. and travel and things like that How, obviously a lot of the teams now fly in and fly out of Catalan on the same day Obviously, you can't do that with, with Toronto. So, it it's going to be interesting to see how the clubs deal with, with that side of things. As far as I know, teams will fly on Thursday, play on the Saturday, fly back Sunday. Mm. Well, I, I, as remember, far as I, know. I remember when I worked for, for Wigan and we went there and back in the same day and just work, working in the media and just working generally. Um, I, I was absolutely shattered uh, by the end of it. So, God, God help. Because I think one, uh, of the, players, one of the because because I, I know we arrived and then the players went straight to the hotel and straight yeah. in, into it individual rooms so they can all have a quick hour uh, two hour nap. But I think because one of the issues day, like, one of the issues that they have is that if they fly out on the Thursday or the Friday, the players are just like twiddling their thumbs and kicking about, aren't they, for the day mm-hmm. before the game? And they feel like that's worse than flying. It's a bit of an holiday as well yeah. then because obviously the players will, 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 might just be around the pool after the gym session or whatever, and, and then they'll go into a little bit of a holiday mode, won't? I think. And I think that's why I think Wigan got beat maybe twice on the bounce at Catalan, and then that's when they decided to to do it that way. To, to go there and yeah. back in the I day. Think but it is a long, long trip. One of the other things to keep an eye out for this season as well is going to be the week after you've been to Toronto, isn't it? So, like, if you're at Toronto this week and you're all then playing Hull away or whatever the following week, it's going to be interesting to see the correlation between the results, how many teams win off the back of going to Toronto away, because you are going to get a little bit of. Yeah, it's almost like the week after Wembley, isn't it? Mm. I mean, I mean, obviously it doesn't start until April, so the key for teams is to get as many wins in as you can before it starts off. Yeah. I mean, Toronto have got, I think it's three home games on the bounce in Toronto first. I think it's Hull, it's Hull then first, Wigan, then yeah. Saints, I think. So, they, but again, it's you only find out once it starts, don't you? So, mm. you, we're just talking hypotheticals at the minute. Yeah. So. Toronto have got another tough game this week, Warrington away. Um, Tony Gizio, I believe, is going to be probably featuring that one, having signed, or he's he's looking at he signing this feature. week. He can no, feature. He can't feature. Um, a good pick up, I suppose, for for them. Yeah, it's one of them, one of them signings where you think, well, why didn't anyone else sort of take the punt on him? Because he's he's un, his class has been on un, he's undoubted. I mean, the the performance he gave in the cup final when they won it was mm. sensational. So he, he's proved he can perform on the big stage and in the big games. So. I mean, I, I was just sort of intrigued as to why no one took the punt on him, basically. Well, I I, I asked Steve McNamara, actually, at, the, at Headingley, at the season launch, I was like, well, what's 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 going on there? Because, obviously, Catalan, but this was before they signed Falau, where mm-hmm. they didn't have any centres. Yeah. And you've got this guy here, and obviously there's some sort of breakdown in relations going there. And, and he had been linked a little bit to a few other clubs, but... Like I say, it's, it's mad that a France international, uh, you know, a player who's done really well over the years for so Catalan has just been sat there and no one's picked him up. Yeah, it, um, is, it is a strange one. I mean, suppose we, we, we know who would have been in for him, but we don't know why mm. he didn't, whether it was their decision or his decision yeah. or, and if it was his decision, why was it his, de- what, what made him decide that? Or if it was the club's decision, what made the club's decide that? So we don't really know. So, I suppose it's up to us to find out so, why and what happened. Basically. So what will Toronto do? Put him in the arms, you reckon? With O'Brien and still at full back. Yeah, because Mel's in Mel's injured, isn't he? And Macron, Macron and Gijo in the arms. And yeah, I think it O'Brien falls, falls perfectly with Mel being injured. Mm. He can just slot straight in. What What do you feel like they're going to do? Is Aka's going to Is Aka's capable of playing the nine at uh, the eighty? Obviously, with Cunningham being injured, or do you think they might use Blake Wallace? Maybe, yeah. As in yeah, they might, they might. They might put Wallace on the interchange bench. Yeah. Bring do, you, do you think? Do you, do you think that? Do you think Toronto should almost go into this game and feel like they've got nothing to lose? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they should go into. Certainly, the games against your your traditional bigger teams, mm. they should go into all of them. Is we got nothing to lose? So if we get something great, it's a bonus. If we don't, well, no one expects us to mm. anyway. So, I think they should approach every the way game against you like you like like your Warrington, your Wiggins, yeah. and your. Eastern talent is it's like we can't lose were you surprised that McDermott mentioned relegation so like he, no. he called it the elephant in the room didn't he but is it not a bit early to be talking about that three games in well, no, no because, because, because he mentioned it before the season started and it is there mm. so Brian's an ultra realist he knows it real relegation is there he knows that our team can or will get relegated so why not mention it mm. so Warrington Toronto Warrington haven't won 
consecutive games since the start of June. Um, obviously, they'll have to start again having lost last week. Um, home win, you think? Yeah, I thought home win. Um, the, the, other, the other Friday night game is Hull KR Huddersfield. Um, it's an interesting one, that one. I like the, the way Huddersfield have started the season, and I like the way that Hull KR started before, obviously, That's last sweet. week's game uh, against Leeds, but I, I'll probably tip Huddersfield. Uh, I like the way they're going. Yeah, Huddersfield seem to have discovered the knack of grinding wins mm. out. Whereas Hull KR, they threw, threw the ball around mm. against Hull, but they fell, and obviously what happened at Leeds happened at Leeds. Yeah. So there'll be an element of bouncing back at home against them, but Huddersfield seem to have that knack of attitude <laughs> of grinding games out and winning. And of course, this is Huddersfield. Huddersfield haven't played a home game yet, so they're in a really nice position where if they win this week, they've won three out of three. Away from home, yeah. Away from home. Do you think we were talking before the show about this is the sort of game that if you're Hull KR, you need to... Or even if you... I mean, to a degree, Huddersfield. Losing at Leeds isn't a big deal. No. But losing at home to Huddersfield is, is a big, big deal. deal. Yeah, I mean, when Hull KR's face list was released, I mean, I'm sort of trying to put myself in the place of Tony Smith here. You'd have gone and gone, win, loss, win, loss, win, loss. This one would have been a win one. Yeah. Um. Saturday then Salford Leeds, which another is another interesting one to to call. It is an interesting one to call. I mean, personally, I think Leeds will win. And I say that as a Salford fan, but um, for for me, Salford have got a lot of settling down to do. They, they look, they're getting better, but they've still got a lot more mm. to do before they sort of hit like being a team. I mean, they've got good players. I mean, Dan Sanderson and Reece Williams have been sensational so far mm. this year, but. The rest of them have to learn to play with them and alongside them, and also that the change in the halfback as well. Mm. There'll be another change again this week. Yeah, will be will be a big thing as how they. And play. to be to be fair to Salford, this time last year they weren't really on the radar. Oh, this no, time no. last year were they? No. It was more as they grew into the season we're, that they become a lot stronger. We were speaking off uh, just before we came on, um, but I think we just need to give Salford time uh, because. I think, did you say 12 or 13 new 12, players? I think, 12 new players. And, and there's a, there's a, there'll probably be around 8 to 9 in each match day squad that weren't there last season. So I just think you've got to give them maybe one or two months <clears> um, <throat> to, to really find their feet. Uh, I'll tip Leeds for this one, yeah. going off last week's result. And then it's Wigan Hull on Sunday, that one. It's a strange one to, to call this one. I mean, a lot depends which Wigan are going to turn up and which Hull are going to turn up, <laughs> essentially. The two for me, the two sort of Jekyll and Hyde teams. When mm. they, when they're good, they're very good. When they're bad, they're horrid. No, sh- no, Sean O'Loughlin for Wigan either. No, no, but that's that's not as big a thing now as it was two, three years ago. I still think it's pretty big. Oh, it's still pretty yeah. big, but it's not as important. That in the past, you'd probably say, "Oh, Sean O'Loughlin's not playing there for Wigan. I'm going to yeah, win." Yeah, yeah. Whereas Wigan can win games now without Sean O'Loughlin. Do you feel like Wigan? Obviously, Wigan have won the two. Do you feel like they've won both of those games without really playing very well? Yes, I do. Um, that that's sort of the impression, which obviously isn't a bad quality to you know. We, they always say well. the secret of being a good team is winning games when not playing well, mm. and we're going to have done that. So maybe they'll kick on again. Again, like we was talking about with Salford, they've got players to in key positions to settle in, mm. and they've got to learn how to play around or with Jackson Asian, and Jackson Asian has to learn more how to play. With Wigan, basically. I quite like that. I think I put this on Twitter last week. I really like the potential between Bevan French, Hastings and Harry Smith, who probably wouldn't have figured in many people's mm. thought at the start of the season. But I just thought that those three, the way that those seem to have had an understanding last week, looked really promising for Wigan. Yeah, I certainly like, certainly like they've got more understanding than previous weeks. But again, it's going to take three, four weeks mm. of playing consecutive games for them to really get to know each other because... Each different player has little sort of individual sort of things that they do, mm. and then the others have to get used to them being around them and how they work. What What do you think about Bevan French from Man of Steel? Oh, I was saying this to, to you in the off season, James. When we was doing the the piece on um, Bet Fred's tips for for Man of Steel, I think at the time it was thirty three to one, uh, which was. Unbelievable, to be fair, and I, I said to you, 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 you was adamant that Zach Ardaker was going to be starting the season at fullback, and I was like, French came in as a fullback. He, he's not coming in from the NRL to play on the wing. He's going to play fullback. He started at fullback, and then once he put that first man of the match performance in, uh, in round one, 
I think I checked the, the Betfred website and then he jumped to 10 to 1. Um, so he's not really an outsider anymore. Yeah, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if he, uh, if he, he was up there or thereabouts. I'll, I'll go with Wigan though, tipping wise. Yeah, I go with Wigan yeah. just. And then Saints, Sydney Roosters on Saturday night. Um, Scoreline wise, or how close do you think? I, I presume you're both going Roosters to win, and but do you think how how competitive do you think it's going to be? I go Roosters by six. I go Roosters by thirteen. So they need to. So you, so you, so you feel like it's going to be a game? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I think the Roosters will just pull away with it towards them. I think Saints will stick in it for the first and, 40, 60 and then. Roosters and it should be a good occasion at Saints. Obviously, stadium looks good when it's full and you know Saturday night. It's always nice to have a Saturday night game. No, I'm going. I'm a Wigan Athletic team ticket holder, so I'm going. We're going. We're going in the afternoon, and then I've got mate the the jersey. <laughs> well, so it's just full sporting action. I don't want to go have my TJ. <laughs> 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 uh, it's Challenge Cup this weekend as as well. Um, the next round is when the four Super League clubs come in. So um, Huddersfield, Ulkar, Toronto, Wakefield, I think it is. So the four who come in, the draws at Ulkar, I think on Monday. Yeah. Um, a quick run through of the games. I hope I've wrote them all down. Lee Batley is Friday night. Sheffield Halifax, um, Siddle Newcastle, Featherstone Barrow, Swinton Lee, Bradford against Underbank Rangers. Underbank actually had never played a professional team before, and obviously they beat a professional team, so they've got a hundred percent record. That'll be a turn up <laughs> for the books if they beat Bradford. Uh, Crusaders Hunslet, London York, uh, Rochdale are playing the Army. Whitehaven against Dewsbury. Witness Oldham. And Workington Doncaster, I think that is, on the bottom. So um, I suppose if, or anyone who wins this weekend will be wanting Toronto away. Yeah. Oh, Tor- well, Toronto. Can they play Toronto away no, in that no, round? No. no. So no. Have, have Toronto said that they're playing? At, have they got to play over here in every round? Or like when they're in the, in the cup a couple of years ago, any say Toronto are drawn at home, the game will be at, at whoever the away team is. Right, right. So they did. So they're not gonna. So they might be away at Underbank. <sighs> That'd be a big game. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so everyone everyone will be looking out for that, won't they? Yeah. Toronto win the draw. That's the one. That's the Definitely, one you want. Yeah. Gary, thanks very much for your time, time and thanks thank for you. coming in. Before before we let you go though, we've got Drew's quick fire questions. Oh, Firstly, oh, quick fire questions. Please. I haven't oh, seen right. these, so oh, I'm geez. I'm worried for you. Uh, the the team you grew up supporting you mentioned Solid. it. Uh, favorite ground. Current ground. Yeah. Not Hull. No, 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 no. <laughs> current favorite current ground heading one. Nice. That makes it. What's your favorite? Are you gonna say the Willows for favorite? Yeah. yeah right. uh, favorite book. Favorite. Please don't say Fifty Shades of Grey. Favorite what? Any book. Any yeah. book at all. Uh, see, I'm not a big reader of books. I read newspapers and magazines. Um, <laughs> uh, Stuart McConey's first one. Biggest scoop. Pie, pies and Prejudice. Biggest scoop you've ever had. Uh, biggest scoop I've ever had. Probably the ice cream out here. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, worst experience in journalism? Surprisingly, waking up in a coma in hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and your best experience? Uh, best experience in journalism? Uh, being at the World Cup final in 17. Oh, nice. Uh, worst ground for you? Worst ground for me? Castleford. <laughs> I'd probably agree. Uh, Favourite ever player? Favourite ever player? Yeah. Miles. Mm. Uh, easiest club to deal with? Uh, easiest club to deal with? They're all very easy. It's just sort of how you deal with them, really. Um, easiest club to If I had to pick one, I'd probably go Leeds. Uh, what rule would you change in the game? Uh, make sure there's an international window in every season. Best game you you've been as a fan. Best game I've been to as a fan. Uh, well, or as a journalist, I suppose. Or as a journalist, game, but he already said twenty seventeen yeah. World Cup final, didn't he? Ruined it for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Best game I've ever been to as a fan. The World Cup semi final, England Tonga. All right. Uh, favorite football team. Stockport County. And finally, uh, sum your wife Gemma up in one word. <laughs> <laughs> in one word. Uh, Persistent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gary, thanks very much for coming on. Cheers, Drew, as always. Um, you've been watching The Last Tackle on loverbelieve.com. Please do um, keep following the site. We're on next week. We've got some special guests from Canada in next week's show, so uh, please tune in for that. And please do like, comment, share, review 
all them various things, and we'll see you next week.